Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's On The Fly. I'm your host, Gene DiFilippo, and our guest this week is Stan Wilcox, the Executive Vice President for Regulatory Affairs at the NCAA. Stan, that's a very, very, very distinguished title. Tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, it was a uh, it was a position that was created um, some time ago. It was originally occupied by uh, Oliver Luck. Um, uh, essentially, it was a position that uh, uh, the voices of the Division One athletic directors, Lead One, uh, and others uh, really was pushing for someone that has had been in the chair as an AD to be uh, on the senior management team at the NCAA um, to, to help uh, basically under, make people understand how things operate in, on, on campus when you're making decisions, particularly in the regulatory uh, affairs space. So uh, after Oliver had left, um, you know, I wish in my fifth year at Florida State. And, uh, and uh, you know, originally that's where I started out my career, was kind of in legislative services, regulatory affairs at the Big East Conference office. And, uh, and so it really seemed to be uh, the right move for me kind of coming full circle after having spent time at the conference office level um, in regulatory as work kind of work and then uh, having started my career off at the NCAA in that in that space it was it made sense uh, to kind of maybe close out my career there and so what it really means is is that there are three major departments uh, within at the NCAA uh, that make up regulatory affairs and that's uh, enforcement the academic and membership affairs they're basically the rules experts and then the eligibility center, uh, they certify all the incoming freshmen, uh, prospective student athletes uh, in, for their academics as well as the amateurism. So, so I'm kind of that person that oversees those three departments. I got uh, basically vice presidents that oversee each of the areas that report to me. And what I try to do is one, try to make the, uh, make the experience for institutions when they're going through the process to kind of be somewhat seamless, meaning that uh, doesn't matter what department within regulatory affairs that you call or get in, you know, that you're dealing with, that the other departments understand essentially how uh, each of the departments work so that there are times when institutions They'll have issues that cross various different departments. They'll cross enforcement along with academic and membership affairs because of student athlete reinstatement requirements, or it also will maybe cross with uh, the eligibility center because of amateurism issues that might come up or, or academic issues. So I try to make sure that there's a cohesiveness that's going on between the three departments as well as um, being that kind of um, troubleshooter to help uh, them get through some difficult issues that come around from time to time. Well, well these days, more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> you've always been a troubleshooter. Uh, you've got a lot of us out of some jams when we were at the Big East Conference. So uh, I've always been indebted to you. Uh -huh. Let's take uh, let's let's go back a little bit though, and, sure. and let's talk about you uh, leaving high school. You were a, a really good player, all state player. You go to Notre Dame, and you play mm -hmm. for Digger Phelps, and your team goes to the Final Four. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was uh, an amazing experience, especially because of the fact that it happened in my freshman year. And it happened, uh, you know, it just so happened that we had five individuals coming in, uh, in in my class who are all either All-Americans, regional All-Americans in, in Kelly Chapuka, Orlando Woolrich, Tracy Jackson, Gilbert Salinas, and myself. We call ourselves the original Fab Five. 
But <laughs> 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 well, we were we were uh, very competitive and really were able to come in and push the seniors, the juniors, uh, obviously the sophomores as well. You know, we had Bill Lambier on that team. We had uh, Bruce Flowers, Duck Williams. Uh, we had a, 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 a cast of individuals who all went on to play and have uh, great professional careers. So that first year, um, you know, we kind of thought, you know, this is not saying it was easy, but we thought that because of in our class that we would be back there, you know, practically every year that we were going to be in school there and not realizing how difficult it is, obviously, to get to the final four until later on when you start, uh, you know, you make the you make the tournament every year, but something along the way goes wrong. So that first year we're able to make it to the final four where we play the first game against Duke. That's been when, back when they had Gene Banks and Spinarkel and Jaminski. Oh, that was a good team. That was that was a great team. And, uh, you know, we thought we were, we were shoe-ins to win that game, and we end up losing that game. And uh, they go on and play against who we thought we were going to be playing against in the finals, in the final four, and that was Kentucky. You know, they had uh, Goose Givens, who actually went for like 40-something points in the championship game, that and that record stood for the longest time. Uh, and they got Rick Roby, Kyle Macy. Kyle Macy, he was a really good player. They they had a they had a really good squad, but they ended up playing Duke in the finals, and they ended up winning the championship that year. Um, and uh, that was the last year actually that they had a consolation game. I don't know if you remember that, but I do. I remember the consolation game. <laughs> they had that they had that game right before the championship game and we were playing in the consolation game against Arkansas and that's when they had Sidney Moncrief, Marvin Delph and Ron Brewer. Oh my god, they these three guys can just jump out of the gym. And it was a close game and so we uh you know, it was like a one point game with I don't know about 5 10 seconds to go. They come down I think it was, uh, it might have been Sidney Moncrief. It was one of them that just kept handling the ball until about two seconds to go. They're at the top of the key, spin around, long jumper, nothing but net. And I see it. I'm under the basket. And I see it coming, and it comes right down. And I catch it as it goes through the hoop. And I'm thinking, oh, God, we come in fourth place now. (laughs) (laughs) So... A trivia question. The last team to come in fourth place when they still had the consolation game, Notre Dame. <laughs> and who caught the last hoop uh, that was made by the opposition? Stan Wilcox. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But a, but a great experience. A really, really great experience. Uh, it was nothing like it. Uh, you know, media around all day. Um, uh, you got Oh, six, seven thousand people back then. The, that stadium maybe held, I don't know, twelve thousand. But half the stands were full for our practices, and uh, it, it was just an unbelievable experience. And uh, you know, just you know, and, and we're going back. I don't know, like almost forty years. You you know, you bring it up to today and imagine what the Final Four is like now for these kids that are playing in it. It is it is an awesome experience uh, that uh, that I'm, I'm I'm proud to say I was a Final Four alumni. <laughs> yes, you can, and there's not a whole lot of people that can say that, my friend. That's true. <laughs> hey, let's go back and talk about the NCAA. Um, sure. What a lot of people don't understand is the NCAA does not set rules. Correct. We. The colleges and universities are the ones that pass the rules. The NCAA uh, is to interpret those rules and enforce them. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's very much so correct. And uh, and even in the interpretation of the rules, um, we have certain parameters that a membership will even put around 
how we interpret certain rules and uh, and people uh, also have or institutions have the opportunity if they don't agree with a staff decision to appeal it to another committee that's made up of their peers. Yeah, the uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people and a lot of uh, uh, just the, the general public um, don't realize that you know we are a voluntary association of uh, of four year institutions who have come together and have, uh, have agreed to uh, participate in athletics under certain rules and, and conditions. And it's the schools, uh, and the schools are made up of three different divisions. You have division one uh, that probably invests the most in college athletics, uh, division two that, uh, and, and each of these divisions have different kind of philosophies as to how they believe collegiate athletics should be run on their campuses. And then you have division three, and each of those divisions uh, create rules for their membership within those divisions, and they agree to abide by them. Now, there's there, there are processes to change and amend and create new rules within each of those divisions, and and not all the time everyone's going to agree uh, with the outcome, but it is it is uh, very close to a, um, a democratic process where the majority the votes will carry the day. And as a member, you have agreed to follow whatever the outcome is or whatever those rules are that your uh, colleagues and member schools have uh, decided would be best for that division, for their for how they run it on their campus. And so, um, so yeah, uh, the national office was is basically created to then carry out what the membership has decided that they want. Um, and uh, so that, that includes within the regulatory space, that includes how we uh, interpret those rules. It includes how we enforce those rules. And it also in, includes how we implement those rules. And so, uh, so we take our, um, our direction uh, we're not a lot, we, we don't go off on our own and kind of create what we want. We take our direction from the membership. Uh, there, there, are so, there are various different committees that the membership uh, have representatives on. And I would say that there are somewhere, there's over 180 committees um, that the NCA has. Wow. With, yeah, which which sometimes makes it very dif difficult and complicated to even know and, and make sure that you're directing things to the appropriate committee to make decisions. But uh, at the hierarchy level, you have the board of governors, which is um, the is comprised of presidents and external uh, individuals who do who do not work for an institution who are just uh, private citizens who happen to have, you know, backgrounds that are either in, in law or in, um, in, in, in athletics in a dif different capacity, uh, in corporations, et cetera. That's the highest body. And they, they represent or they oversee the entire membership, which would be division two, one, two, and three, and generally make decisions on common rules. That means rules that uh, will cross all three divisions. And then there's in division one, there's a board of governors that, uh, excuse me, a board of directors that oversee division one. And then they have a council and similar in division two and three. But uh, many people, as you, as you've noted, uh, the, it's, it's a very somewhat complicated um, structure for people to, gr to grasp, but the main thing is, the main thing that people need to be aware of is that it's voluntary, it's not mandatory uh, uh, for schools to be part of it. And, uh, you know, schools do choose to be a part of it because of the, the brand recognition, the, uh, the quality of the championships that we provide, 
and, and, and what we're trying to do for young people, and that is making sure that they're getting quality education, they're getting their degrees, and that they're having the greatest uh, athletics experience while doing so uh, at, at their institutions. So those, those are the things that I think every institution, every athletic director, commissioner, uh, and everybody uh, at the, the highest level, that's their goal. Their goal is to create an experience for these young people that's you know the best experience they possibly can have so that they, when they come out and they graduate, they, they are able to become very productive in, in society. You know, again, the majority of them are not going to be going professional, uh, as the commercial says. Uh, they're going to be professionals in other areas. And uh, that's, that's, one, that's really our, our main focus. You know, Stan, uh, I shake my head when I hear people say, wow, the NCAA, they make up some crazy rules and this and that and the other thing. You and I sat on the council together for years. Yes. We mm -hmm. were the ones who voted the rules. It's not exactly. the NCAA, but exactly. people don't understand that. They exactly. just don't. Exactly. It's, and, and as I mentioned, the number of uh, committees that uh, make up the uh, association, uh, that, that's one of those major co committees that you and I sat on uh, and uh, were a part of uh, molding and making the rules. And we, and we would, uh, you know, each conference has represent, representatives on, those, uh, on the council. And uh, sometimes you have to put aside your, uh, your institutional, um, uh, uh, the way your institution might vote, uh, or even the way your conference might vote on something. And you have to look at the bigger whole, the bigger picture, and say what's best for the entire association, what's best for all the schools that make up the, the NCAA, and you, and you vote that way. Um, but, uh, uh, but there's also, as you know, um, people that come to these meetings with directed votes because you talk about those issues, those um, proposals at the conference level and uh, everybody within the conference level kind of agrees upon how the conference should vote on certain matters. And we kind of come there with directed votes. And, and in some instances, you're allowed to kind of vote maybe differently than what the conference says based upon what the conversation or issues uh, that might be brought up during the discussion at those meetings. That's the other thing that I think people uh, don't realize sometimes, and that is that it's, uh, these rules aren't created in a vacuum and these rules are just not thought up willy nilly. These, these are very, uh, very strategically thought out um, proposals and rules uh, as, as people are thinking about how this may impact uh, the well-being of student athletes. And that's, and that's key. And that's key as to how people vote on various different things. You know, Stan, you mentioned that it's a volunteer organization that the membership sets the rules and all. It seems more lately than ever before, if a particular school, particularly a state institution, doesn't mm -hmm. like a particular rule, all of a sudden the attorney general from that state mm -hmm. files a lawsuit mm -hmm. against the NCAA to try sure. to get the, the rule changed. In some cases it's worked and some it hasn't, but that's gotta be difficult for all of you. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's 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 difficult for us because it puts us in a position where we then maybe think, okay, well, this might be an issue that the entire membership needs to talk about because maybe the membership feels uh, you know a certain way about a particular rule, the same way that this school may feel about it as they decide to go the legal route to get a remedy. Now. And what I would say, and then what I've talked, uh, when I talk to people about this new phenomenon, you know, I just kind of say, you know, um, the one thing that, uh, that, that it has always somewhat been a negative for the, 
for our membership and our association is how, how long it might take to get a rule changed. Because it you know, goes through a, a proposal part process, and then it has to go through various different committees for their feedback into it before it maybe gets to the council. And then the council has to have a, um, you know, uh, basically a vetting of it. And, and then you want to have a period of time where the membership gets an opportunity to see the proposal and make comments. Now, it could be a year process before a rule can get changed. Whereas going to the, uh, the legal process, some schools have found that uh, particularly those who may have gotten favorable outcomes have found that that might be quicker for them to get uh, or to address the issue that they see that uh, is not working on their campus and doesn't work for them. Therefore, they go outside of the normal process with, uh, as opposed to working within the NCA, they go outside to get the legal rulings. And that it's somewhat detrimental for the uh, association because now you're putting the uh, rule, in a sense, rulemaking to some degree into the hands of the, the, the legal system. Uh, and, um, and, and that might help, it might be good for that one institution. But that may not be good for the vast majority of institutions who all agree that this is how the rules should be and this is how it should operate. So, so, so when I think about the, what's happening, I, I, I think of it in a way that, you know, they're, they're taking an, a, a different uh, course because they want to they wanna address a, an issue quicker than it would and normally. they want a positive response. Is yes, what they want from that, the courts. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being very, um, you know, you're, cordial you're about being how very diplomatic, and I'm telling, uh, I'm being a little bit more uh, candid here, in that that's why people go to the legal system thinking they can win. All right, let's talk about some of the legal issues that the NCAA is is facing right now. Um, okay. Why don't you quickly go over Alston, which has been settled, and then take some of the, the, the issues that are being discussed in court right now and just, just tell us quickly about each of them. Okay, well, uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell you, I'm not the, the legal uh, expert here at the National Office. We have uh, individuals within, that, within our legal department that can rattle it off like this, but I can give you a general kind of understanding. That's what we want. You're smart. You went to Notre Dame. You can give us a good general, <laughs> a good general answer. Uh, well, well, in general, you know, after the, the Alston ruling, you know, that was a Supreme Court case uh, that we lost pretty pretty big. Uh, I think it was a unanimous decision. Uh, after that, um, you know, that's when I think really all the other legal cases start coming down. Um, now, Can you the, go over what the Alston case was, just real quick for everybody? Uh, essentially, uh, essentially, it was uh, a continuation of the O'Bannon uh, case. In essence, um, student athletes being able to have the rights to uh, monetize off their uh, name, image, and likeness. Um, uh, so it, it was a, a culmination of uh, of those of those issues, issues around um, um, not putting restraints on student athletes' abilities to earn um, uh, additional monies. From their from their own name, image, and likeness, from uh, from even other things that other students are allowed to do. Um, so, the the cases that are kind of ongoing now are, are all kind of offshoots of that. In that, they're also looking to uh, further go even further than uh, maybe what. Uh, the O'Bannon case and the Alston case did. They're they're looking at now trying to number one 
get uh, uh, financial remedies for those who um, were former student athletes, but should have come under the new ruling. Therefore, they should be allowed to receive compensation for their NILs. And then you have another class of those student athletes who are currently in school, who were not or, or did not, were not able to take advantage of their NIL until we changed the, the ruling recently. Now, now what, what the motivation is for some of these attorneys that are bringing these cases, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest thing or the biggest issue is whether or not we're going to get to a point where essentially student athletes can be paid uh, 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 for their participation, whether or not they can collect a bargain uh, for, um, for the revenue share of the uh, multimedia rights deals that are ongoing. Um, uh, that's where the current cases are really moving towards. And with that, you have these other set of cases with the National Labor Relations Board uh, where they are, and, and this just happened at um, uh, Dartmouth, where there, and, and years ago it was Northwestern, but essentially you have uh, regional uh, labor relations organizations that are saying that student athletes essentially are employees of institutions and thereby should be able to unionize and then collect the bargain. So um, those are, that's really the, a, a kind of at a 30,000 foot level, right. the crux of what's going on in the legal world right now, as far as the lawsuits that are coming on, uh, uh, that are and, ongoing. And you, you did a real good job in explaining that. Um, I just want to add to that, that the Austin case allowed colleges and universities to uh, provide up to $5,800 per student per year. Cool. And with the case at Dartmouth, um, if they are, if the student athletes are employees and can unionize, the only way um, that they can get paid and, and all is by forming a union and having a collective bargaining agreement, correct? with the conferences or the television networks or, or whoever it might be. Can you, can you discuss that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, and um, uh, the, the way I would kind of uh, talk about it is these um, National Labor Relations Board cases generally start off with uh, maybe a few student athletes at a particular institution who believe that they ought to be paid as employees. I can't say that that's the vast majority of student athletes. I believe the vast majority, at least from our um, um, surveys, et cetera, they, they recognize if they become student, if they become employees of, a, of, of an institution, you know, that changes a lot of things. It also creates kind of an imbalance because you have labor, labor rules within state regulated labor rules that are different by state by state, similar to what's you know, happening in the whole NIL space and why we need to try to get Congress to intercede to try to create you know, an even playing field in a sense, one set of rules as to how you uh, administer NIL, well, the same thing will happen if student athletes become, uh, become employees. There will be states that may decide, uh, you, know, you know, unless a federal rule comes out and says they are all employees, there'll be some states that say they're employees and other states that say they're not. There may be certain schools uh, that say that they are employees and some that say they're not. Uh, again, we will be faced with or put in a situation where we need some kind of uniformity in the rules surrounding um, whether student athletes are or are not student uh, employees of an institution. Um, but 
it's a it's it's a somewhat of a complex issue, um, in, in my in, in my estimation, and that is and, and that what what complicates it is the uh, the fact that I, I don't see how do they get to uniformity uh, for all student athletes, and uh, particularly when you have there are certain states that uh, are more pro-union uh, unionization of, empl of employees and there are those that are not and so, you have you have right to work states um, right. a lot of the states in the south are right to work states and uh, the majority of the states in the northern part of our country are unionized so exactly. I, that's going to be interesting to see how that all works yeah, and, and I, I hate to see student athletes in positions where uh, they become employees at will. You know, that means, um, you know, institutions, uh, you, you don't have a, a good game or a good year, you know, they can, they can fire you. You know, you, they can fire you based on your performance. You know, uh, to, to, to maintain, I think, athletics at the highest level within the, the academy I don't see how you create um, a way for student athletes to be considered employees. I assume that uh, you know the big issue is how do student athletes kind of bargain or, or be involved in charting their own course moving forward. And I've always felt that the best way for them to do that, which has been expanding and expanding, is through more integration of our student athletes into our governance process and our governance system, the NCAA's governance process and governance system. And that's, you know, you uh, know about back when we created student athlete advisory committees on campus at the conference level, national level, and now they have voting rights. Um, they're expanding those voting rights and, uh, and they're, 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 they're really involved in making sure that student athletes rights are being protected in any NCA legislation that's being adopted. And I think that's the right way to go uh, uh, in order to keep high colleg collegiate athletics within the academy, as opposed to creating employees uh, of them. And uh, if you do that, I, I just see some, some schools just saying, well, well, we can't do this, we're out, or you know, they're going to change their varsity programs into club sports, or, you know, you're just going to see a lot of changes happening across the board. Stan, last question here, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners want to know about NIL. I mean, it's talked about on every talk show and every newspaper, on every television program. Um, what is the NCAA doing about NIL? Are there restrictions and are you looking to enforce those restrictions? Uh, yes, there, there, there are restrictions, um, but I think what has created the confusion and the, um, what people are calling the wild, wild west is the intersection between name, image, and likeness and what we call the transfer portal or being able to, student athletes being able to transfer and be immediately eligible under the one-time transfer exception in certain sports, it didn't uh, like football, basketball, and baseball, uh, ice hockey, um, they weren't able to do that. Now, then they changed the rule to allow them to be able to do it. And so what it's what it has created, it has kind of created the, the using of, uh, of uh, NIL, uh, offers of NIL to get individuals, current student athletes, uh, as well as pers prospective student athletes who attend specific or certain institutions. And that's not what NIL was designed to do. Uh, nor was it what the transfer portal uh, was designed to do. And so we still are investigating and involved in um, uh, enforcing 
uh, situations where we know that there is tampering going on, which is a tampering is just a rule within our recruiting uh, regulations as well as in our eligibility regulations, as well as offers and inducements. You know, these are these are these are rules that are separate from uh, from NIL or uh, from the transfer portal. And so we continue to, to uh, enforce those rules, but what sometimes gets confused is when you have that intersection, then people think it's something that has to do with NIL when it really has to do with the general uh, recruiting rule or a general uh, uh, rule or around eligibility uh, that we're really in continuing to enforce because those rules are still on the books. And, and so uh, we deal with a lot of cases that end up getting settled through what we call negotiated resolution, where we basically um, get together with the institution and agree that there was a violation that occurred, agree on what the corrective action should be, agree on what the penalties will be, and then just take that case and uh, get, it, get it blessed by the Committee on Infractions. There are, there are many of those cases that, are, that uh, are, are happening and that are getting resolved that way, many more than the ones that might be reported in, in the paper. Though, uh, those cases are taking much longer, uh, generally because there is disagreement about um, how the rule applies in their given situations. So basically, what you're saying is that it, the NIL is interfering with recruiting rules and the NCAA is looking to enforce recruiting rules um, where um, people are, are using NIL in the recruiting of student athletes. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and, and in some cases, then they, they may not even be aware of it because uh, because, uh, again, just like in any regular recruiting space, you know, there are those individuals that go off and try to think that they might be doing something positive for their institution, but don't realize that what they're doing is not permissible under NCA recruiting rules. Right. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's been uh, challenging, if, uh, to say the least. But uh, I think that uh, the, the most important thing that, that we're doing uh, is, uh, I, I guess this gives me an opportunity to maybe talk about the holistic model, is that we're looking at student athletes and figuring out what is best for student athletes. How do we provide better benefits to our student athletes? How do we provide, um, uh, you know, uh, within the holistic model, it really talks about uh, their talks about how do we make sure that they're getting the right kind of insurance uh, even after their playing days are over? How, how do we provide additional uh, resources for getting their, grad, getting their degrees even after they may have their playing days are over? Um, you know, how do we make sure that they are getting the right mental health, uh, they're getting the right training, they're getting the right, uh, you know, getting all the best practices as it applies to what student athletes really need in order to be very successful in their particular sport. So we, we, we are really trying to, um, um, uh, again, do what's best for student athletes as a whole and, and trying to make sure that student athletes are in a part of those decisions because they're the ones that really understand what uh, is needed to, to improve their lives and improve uh, their experiences on campus. And that's, uh, that's something that we're keenly uh, astute to and are trying to uh, push forward. And I know that at the end of the day, everybody, that's all that we all really want. And that is do what's in the best interest of our student athletes. Well said, Stan. And you know, you've been, you've been living proof of that uh, on the conference level um, as a director of athletics and now at the NCAA and we're very, very fortunate to have you there, my friend. And I want to thank you today uh, for coming on. You're extremely informative. 
uh, I learned, I continue to learn a lot of things myself. And so these are good for me as well. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank you even more for being a friend. Well, I want to thank you, Gene. Thank, thank you for having me on. And obviously, thank you for being a friend and colleague for so many years. And yeah, I know thanks. that's going to continue. That will continue in the future. Yeah, good. Sure will. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thanks, Gene. Take care. We're out of time on this week's On The Fly. I'm your host, Gene DiFilippo. I want to thank you for being with us this time, and we'll see you next time.